Hello everyone again and welcome today for our third day of wonderful interviews. I hope that you have enjoyed the, the two days, previous two days of some wonderful guests. And um, yes, today we are welcoming another wonderful guest well, uh, welcome, please welcome Espen Salberg. So, hello Espen, good evening to you. <laughs> yes, you just need to unmute. And I did. That's it. <laughs> I can hear you good now. Good evening, Snigel. Yeah. Good evening, good evening. Say hello to all our viewers already. <laughs> I will, I will indeed. Hello, hello, and thank you for checking in on us. <laughs> yeah, so we had, I was just uh, saying, we had some wonderful um, uh, guests and uh, visiting back to memory lane in, in dancing all the way to decade 50, 50th decade with uh, Anthony, and it was absolutely wonderful. And uh, yes, yeah, so let's start straight away with your journey. So 70s, 80s. So what most vividly you remember from those decades? Oh, uh, <laughs> in, from, from my own personal point of view, uh, was the fact that it was possible for um, dancers from a small country like Norway where nobody thought that you danced um, to be able to come in on the international scene and have success. Um, that was probably the breakthrough in a way from personally. Um, but there was good days, you know, uh, there was um, seriousness, but within more of a normality. Um, I had a day job, so I only practiced in the evenings. <laughs> Nowadays, the dancers say, oh, I can't have a job because I have no time to practice. So that was a major difference. Um, the fact that I managed to move to London and stay there first as amateur and then later on as a professional was a major achievement. Um, also, learning the game a little bit, <laughs> you know, from being kind of a naive amateur dancer who saved up to come to Blackpool to dance the under 21 and then sort of sharing boarding houses with famous people. And through those <laughs> friendships, you started to get to know a little bit who is who yes right mm -hmm. so, but, so this is your little like journey how you started but what's now if you think about the dancing so in 70s i believe he was inspired to start dancing what by watching some tv program dance tv program oh yeah you heard that you heard that <laughs> yes it was actually it was um um from um Ken and Blanche Ingalls for a junior formation team oh, wow. that did a display of what used to be in those days the um, Danish English team match. Right. So one team was in Copenhagen and the other one was in London at the Hammersmith Palais or the Lyceum, I guess. And uh, through technology of Eurovision in those days. <laughs> Um, you could see it and and uh, yeah and I said to my mom where do you learn to do that she said there's something called dance schools I said oh never asked anymore <laughs> so that's how it's yeah. so once you yeah. uh, sort of went a little bit up already in your um, rankings and and what you remember then obviously you went into 80s how big change in dancing was then and how this evolved how do you know how, who inspired you to change and what, what sort of things you did well uh, inspiration um, came from seeing other dancers at the time. 
um, I was totally mesmerized by Peter Maxwell and Lynn Harmon as a young amateur. Right. Um, and then later on, um, obviously starting off by doing modern and Latin, um, trying to do modern, uh, <laughs> you then got to the, to the point of having to specialize mm -hmm. in a way. So I was fascinated by um, Latin mood, basically, and Latin music. That what did it for me. And then I uh, was very interested in trying to do my own or our own choreography. Okay. So that was something that I experimented with very, very early and which has come to good stead later on in my career, basically. Um, and then I was lucky enough to, what I consider, end up having the right teachers. Mm -hmm. So it was um, mainly in the end, Walter Laird and um, Joan at night, and um, uh, Michael Stulianos and Lorna Lee had been um, my int our introduction teachers as amateurs. But then, of course, then later on, we became fellow competitors. So it didn't always <laughs> work to yeah. to teach your fellow competitor. Yes. So mm. and, uh, if you think about today's dancing, um, perhaps like you even mentioned that you said competitors uh, can't have normal job because they're so busy practicing. And then yet, you know, you practice what less than means or was it much more better practice because you had less time because you still all improved a lot? Yeah, first of all, I would say that the dancing in those days maybe did not have the amount of details that we have today. So it was more general, um, being able to put character and mood into an established form of Latin American dancing, which had kind of a touch of ballroom principles in the fact of the lines and things like this much more and not so much of movement and um but it also inspired me with my then wife to try and go for a lot more development within ourselves and create identity yeah. and i think the word identity then and in the 90s as well um had a much larger influence on the dancers than what it has today mm -hmm. because today even though they are extremely clever it's kind of stereotyped in many ways. So would you say, do you miss a little bit of that in Dente? I, I agree because I think every yeah. person had very strong character. So how do you develop that identity? It depends on your teachers, I think, <laughs> that they sort of foster um, and find out who you are or what the teacher gives you gives you food for thought and then you go along plus i was always fascinated by the entertainment industry musicals ballet uh, whatever i could see uh, dance shows and you steal a bit from shakespeare and that becomes <laughs> things that you can use but this I think also the identity lies in that we never had so many teachers as what the couples today have, mm -hmm. right? So um, it was more 
a peace of mind and you had collaboration with your main teacher and you trusted that teacher to form you right. and you didn't have to sort of ping pong between informations from many many sources that you then dilute what you have naturally and conform to what you believe is safe and expected Yes, well, actually, it's strange enough. Well, not strange enough. I, I, I'm not uh, surprised about that because of these identities. Same Anthony said, same uh, Michael and Vicky said exactly the same, and ah. Lorna and uh, Michael too. Uh, so, because I think it goes back to the, the point where if you have too much choice or trying maybe even to please all of your teachers in a way, you can't really get strong in one point. So, so would you, but, but you see, so what would your advice be? Because obviously it's, it's quite a, uh, uh, how to say, scary thing to drop your teachers if you already have them and somehow you have to know oh, which way to go. Yeah, I, mm, then I was said the question, why do you have many teachers? <laughs> right, and we don't want to answer that. <laughs> Well, no, but, but also it could be, couldn't you? Because obviously when you dance, you said there were much less choice, not even choice, but less uh, champions. And now when you think, if you grow up as a junior, you have so my, many wonderful dancers and in a way you want to, to try them all, I suppose. <laughs> yes. So in a way you can say it's curiosity yeah. that lands you in the, <laughs> in the ditch. <laughs> Maybe. Um, I, do, I do believe that um, it's a teacher's responsibility to give a student information that makes sense. And, and also makes sense for what I believe that I, as a dancer, am looking for or what the teacher would guide me to try and understand that I need, right? So I do be, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, I've never tried it, but I'm sure very often these so-called um, uh, plural visits to, to more teachers always happen very often before competitions right and uh, it's very little constructiveness that can be done to not disturb a performance that is important a week later you know yeah. so um then very often i think there's a safety game being played make it clean stand up don't do too much you know all of these things and it does not nurture identity of who you are and how you really feel yeah i'm not knocking it no. but that might be the reason why mm. right. so if you go again back into your competitive years when you competed what uh, would say your would be experience or even advice or memories compared to these days competitors you know comparing did you had less competitions do you had more time to practice and change is it some people perhaps doing too much competitions or would you wish that you would have had more competitions like today's competitors so why would you <clears throat> i think today's competitors have too many competitions so they don't really have time to improve because there's a expected performance to be had before something very subtle can be changed in your developed in your dancing and then whether it's wanting to dance the competition or it's tempting price money <laughs> you know that you go I'll, have, I'll just do it and then we'll be fine afterwards rather than say i'll i'll, I'll skip this one because i need more time to develop what i'm trying to find out right now this i think is missing a little bit um the competitions 
in our time were still the majors right. international uk blackpool and then in betweens also in england and of course the worlds and the european and then you got the german open and then you got another open so it actually added and added a little bit um but i do feel today it's very much um to cover if you want to be expected to be there and when i say expected to be there i also do find that there's a trend sometimes for um organizers who obviously want to have the best dancers there all the time to offer um, special deals economically if they appear and uh, that is tempting to today's competitors who are in the trap of maybe having a lot of lessons at a very high cost so that is probably also one of the reasons yes <laughs> right. I remember my first <laughs> lessons was 12 and 6 pence. That was 12 shillings and 6 pence. That was less than a 2 pounds in those days. So oh, that's, that's <laughs> a huge change to now definitely. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So if, if, if again to go back a little bit into actual dancing itself as it moved through the decades. Yes. Uh, how what are other things mechanically technically you are missing maybe now uh from then or maybe not i don't know <laughs> i am not missing technical things i, I think because they have all been a little bit more advanced but what i do miss is probably the more subtle choices of interpreting some of it and not having to make everything be visual plus for the sake of competitiveness exaggerated yeah that i think is um a little bit a dangerous trend even though i do realize in latin that uh, the top dancers of today are um, waking up to dance more than do <laughs> yes yeah. well actually i think anthony mentioned that that it's the dance part that's missing you know it's obviously they're yeah. highly trained everyone is so fit and so talented we cannot doubt that yeah. everyone but somehow it's going yeah the dance part is missing and so how when you used to go sorry sorry yes carry on no 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 exactly so you you ask somebody uh, in in a in a in a movement that they dynamically enter it and i said can you release here i said oh but then i lose my competitiveness and i said uh-uh <laughs> you know so sorry i interrupted you no but that's good so how well, i think that's what co competitors the dancers now are fearing of is that uh, dance and competitiveness versus how much of each, as you said, so you then suddenly not looking boring as they think. And, and I think we as audience, we don't think they're boring. It's opposite. It's awakening, right? But <laughs> yes, I totally agree with you. And I, I try to convey to advanced dancers that because they always say, oh, but you cannot win with quality. And I said, you are so wrong, but it's not competitive. And I said, listen, if your tools of quality are that muscular memory ingrained in you, it's up to you to use your sense of artistry to then make contrasting competitive motions out of that kind of dancing and not that you need to have constructed dimensions that you cannot dance in yes 
Yes, but it's a scary mm. thing, I think, for, for them. And so going again back into your time, how did you manage yeah. to, to not to be afraid of not being competitive? How, how did you manage to, to just dance? Or, or... Do you know, I, I just wanted to be different. Right. Yeah, I didn't want to be what all the others did, even if that was successful. So I thought it was, I would rather go on the floor and people saw that we were on the floor and they looked because they wonder, I wonder what they're bringing now. Mm. Yes. And that element is um, hardly there, except they bring degrees of energy performance of the same thing. Yes. So again, A little bit. Right. So going through these decades, when do you think slowly this competitiveness started to creep in in maybe over exaggerated way? I do believe that it mm, probably during the last 10 years. Right. Yes. And why would you say, because I think sometimes, you know, if you detect the reason why that happened, perhaps the competitors will realize what's gone wrong. So why do you think that happened? I am not quite sure, but is this word evolution, right? That things have to move on. But what has to move on is a better way of dancing, yeah. <laughs> right? Or more interesting. I meant and that. not just, <laughs> yeah, and not just for the sake of dynamics. Yes. Yeah, so and look, or looking bigger. And this, I want volume, I want volume. I said, will dance the volume within timing your partner with yourself. You don't have to put the volume into your hold and look like you're stiff, you know? <laughs> yes. So. I hope actually a lot of people listening to this because you know what is amazing that um, throughout so far as I said conversations, everyone touching similar subjects. So I, I hope that yeah. suddenly they, our dance dancers, current dancers, they will hear that and they will stop being afraid and leave that fear and actually become these individu individuals and forget the competitiveness. Yeah, I, I do. I do feel do you know i do feel that we the covid period mm. has been bad and good um bad because of all the disasters and the sad things that have happened and good because we've had time to reflect and the clever dancers have improved in this period by finally having time to go into detail of things they've heard but have never had the time to perfect. And then they probably have some time to experiment because <laughs> yes. they're on they're on their own. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um yeah, so and um I do look forward to the comps when they start again because i do i do believe that we're in for surprises yes, now another thing also with this is that the when the levels of performance grow there are very many couples who fight for a few places and in order to be the one that gets the chance you have to distinguish yourself different from the others yes 
Definitely. Yeah. One another little thing I want to touch uh, through the decades and your opinion. Obviously, you are a great stylist and, and, and a fashion icon in our industry with uh, producing so many beautiful, wonderful designs of your clothing and, um, and obviously uh, dance clothing and evening wear and so on. Mm. Um, so as the decades moved, um, obviously, I'm sure you was very glad to get rid of your cat suit, so that's for sure. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And I remember when we got out of the cat suit, um, I tried that on some of my students at the time. <laughs> and it was very inspired by Versace. <laughs> So we're talking about the um, late 80s, early 90s, where the shoulder pads and the pleated <laughs> pants on the men, you know, and the baggy pants and all of that. And um, somehow that sort of trendy influence from what they saw in the fashion magazines, as opposed to the stretch jumpsuits, which looked like they were part of a, an isolated tribe. <laughs> that actually brought interest amongst people. And I do believe that mm, since then, we've had so many trends and the trends are back again. The trends come back again and it's revivals and they, when they come back, they are in today's version of things. And I do find that nothing is that unusual anymore. But I always try to say to the dancers, dance according to the character you want to address in according to the character you want to be. And what would then enhance, also dramatically, the communication between the two of you as a product to transmit. And um, I also find that very often, especially the ladies, what they wear reflects how they move yes and not just that i have to i am tiny so i need volume or i pad myself and all of these things there's better <laughs> there's better solutions with things that can move on you rather than can stand on you mm. That's a very interesting point and, and, and I hope all the girls uh, made a note of that. And now since this um, uh, series of uh, conversations is called Then and Now and every guest um, receives one question that is exactly the same, uh, one of the last questions uh, on the interview. And um, so if you were to create a new decade, just there, and you would be allowed to take three items from your time and three items from today's, what those would be to create a perfect dancer or perfect decade of dancers. <laughs> um, I would love to take the sheer enjoyment and happiness of the 80s with the, I guess, innocence of what we didn't know. That's interesting. And mix it with the experience <laughs> we now have. But I would I would not like to take the music of the 80s with me because that was very much pop tunes and so forth. So the music that is played today um, is much better and the speed of it is much better and requires more for the dancers. 
And um, the third thing from each would probably be that start to believe in the right person for yourself in your development. And then when you go on the floor today, you believe that that's enough. So I can log out now, I think. I end. I don't know what happened here, but um, uh, the, the we lost Espen, and um, I have to. I'm so sorry. I don't know if we could bring Espen back because he just disappears. Something happened to the Wi-Fi, and um, can you hear me, um, uh, Yuka and Sirpa? Yes. yes, we are here. Yes, and I I cannot believe that Espen just. Um, I hope he can reconnect to us within a few I'll seconds. Don't worry, I'll just call him here. Yes, could you do that? It's just something, it just froze and then I lost him and uh, and and then the, the whole screen got lost and I... I he so actually switched off can... himself. Let me see if I can connect with him. <laughs> this is funny. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> Can you hear us? We can bring him back so we can, we can finish the conversation. You could just sign in, in. yes, please. That's what happens with the these, these days Wi-Fi. You can't rely fully on. Let me see, hold on. Espen, can you hear me? <laughs> Only I'll get it. Oh. Come back online. Thanks. It's ringing. Are we? Is he there? No. It's ringing. Hopefully. Hello, Espen. <laughs> <laughs> this is very funny. <laughs> We're live with um with uh, Snigwale, but can you just log back on so we can all meet online uh, uh, Snigwale, somehow she lost connection and that's why it ended up so abruptly so if you could just if you could just log on yes log back on so log back on yeah <laughs> well, okay thank you so very much these things can okay. happen so great so we'll bring oh i'm so sorry everyone who is viewing, uh, but Espen is coming back to finish his... <laughs> <laughs> Technology! <laughs> I know, that's wonderful. Thank you. How are you anyway whilst waiting for Espen? That is very good, I think. Okay, yeah. well, you're doing a great job. Wonderful to listen to all these conversations. 
I'm glad. I'm glad. Yes, I think, well, you've seen probably online how many beautiful responses were there and how everyone really, truly enjoyed. Yes. D did you Absolutely. read them? And it's been very interesting listening. Just makes us all I miss you all very, yeah. very much more. We already miss everybody, but now we miss you even more. <laughs> right. So let's see if Espen coming back soon. So where is where is he? <laughs> he lost somewhere. It's nice to be amongst friends, so we're not that official. <laughs> you know. yeah. Yes. Um, well, whilst we're waiting for for first one to come back and then just to, to properly say goodbye and thank you, you can perhaps a little bit start with your journey through 90s and uh, well, eight, late 80s, 90s, yes, into 2000s. Um, how was it then? compared to where you, what, what it is now? Well, I think uh, when we started dancing early on as juniors and uh, onto our professional careers, we were very fortunate, first of all, in our partnership that we were able to start with the same teacher. We were not from the same town, but we, we started with the same teacher. So we had a very much a similar background and it was not unlike the, so what we would call the English uh, medal system where we went through the technical book and little by little learned one step at a time. Like I've, well, we've heard many of the other ones already mentioned how they learn a little bit at the time and then you didn't have too much information. So you really had to learn the little that you learned and then, uh, the next one, next little addition came on and therefore you, you were able to slowly learn things. And I think that's one, maybe one of the greatest differences to today's dancing. Yeah, obviously the connections and traveling wasn't that easy. Oh, sorry, is Espen there? Yes, yeah, so we'll just uh, bring this one. I feel so terrible. <laughs> well, back. just a more. Hello, Espen. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry, no, come on, man. <laughs> sorry, Aspen, uh, just your video. Yes, I'm so sorry, Aspen. I don't know what happened. You froze and then you just gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was talking away and I see your smile like this. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> so, and then it says, Sneagol left the meeting. So anyway, here we are. Here we are. Yes, because I tried to Good reconnect to you and I wasn't sure what's happening. So I just tried to bring you back. So I, it was just really a freaky moment. So I'm no, so sorry. I, I already put the iPad in the, la <laughs> in, in, the, in the shelf. So anyway, good to see you all. Good to see you, you too. too. You look beautiful. You look gorgeous, the two of you. Oh, you too. You. you too. Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, it looks fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, so I think we, I'm not sure if you have managed to finish your perfect uh, couple for the, uh, you know, your futuristic decade, but I think you, you carried on with the music and with uh, a little bit more, the speed that you would like from here, right? And then I think, well, that was the end. Yes, and then I do believe that I said that I would like that the couples would go back to maybe having just one voice more that they listened to and trusted and believed in. And then of that today, I would say go on the floor believing that that's going to be enough. I think that's what I wish would be the difference of today. Yes. Right. Well, thank you so much, Espen, for joining us today. And you I'm are so sorry for this uh, little uh, glitch. Ah, never mind. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Things can happen. I don't. I don't get upset. <laughs> right, that's good. So you have a good evening, um, and uh, see you sometime very soon. Hopefully. Bye. Hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Enjoy so, yourself, guys. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you too. Okay. Bye. <laughs> yes. Bye. 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 All right. Good. So that's. I feel better now that we did a proper proper goodbye. So you yeah. you were saying yeah. now, uh, Sirpa, something from the the eighties and nineties and twenties. Uh, sorry. Yeah. What what did we start? <laughs> oh, uh, about the dancing. And uh, no, I mean, like I said, we had the first teachers they were clever enough also to 
um, take us abroad and they were also bringing teaching to our hometown or my hometown and so there was a connection to the international dancing but a little bit like what Espen said coming first times abroad quite innocent and not knowing what's going on but then of course when we started as professionals together we already both they look well is the common thing oh, awesome are you there, Espen? <laughs> I just muted him. <laughs> so having this experience from competing a little bit abroad, but uh, obviously we didn't have the future plan that we could be professional dancers. It wasn't the profession to take up, but then that's how we ended up anyways. And mm. uh, since then, 90 was actually the first competition ever we danced together. And um, then our last competition was 2001. So it was a very intense 10, 11 years in, on competition floor. Of, of course, after that, we did shows a long time after. And uh, so uh, I think our competing career was very, very much um, turbulent. turbulent. But it, it was through the commitment because for yeah. us, when we got together privately and started teaching, it, it wasn't the plan that we shall compete, but then actually, we uh, returned to UK to do our professional exams. And um, that was the opportunity to return to an international competition to watch the uh, couples dancing. And when we saw the professional competition, we both looked at each other and we were like, this is what we need to do. And I had no choice. Did we lose Sneagle now? Oops. We're the hosts at the moment. <laughs> so let's just Hello carry everybody. on everyone. We seem to have lost our uh, host. host of the show, but never mind. I have my wife here who can take over. <laughs> so Mr. Hapalainen, what would you like to talk about? Well, Forget the we dancing. Just, we, we'll carry on uh, about the, the um, history really. Yeah. So the, yeah. basically what, what we did, we had our commitment to the uh, wanting to do professional competing career and then basically didn't look back until we decided that it was time for us to retire from competing, not from dancing, but from competing. We, we had a very strong years of competing and traveling around the world and uh, taking, taking up any challenge there was for a professional competitor. Hmm. Do you think we should ask Snigol to join the meeting? <laughs> <laughs> because um, since we are the host, our techni technical aid here might say that if we are now the hosts, what should we do to reconnect we to with her? In. We yeah. need to let her in. So let's do that. Is she gonna ask me that? See? Or... Mm -hmm. oh, she's yeah. here coming back. She's connecting. Yeah. Yes, I don't know what is going on today. <laughs> I'm just I'm, I'm now tell, terribly sorry. I don't know what's going on. It's, it's so good, funny. good. We'll carry on. I'm sure Mark <laughs> and Karen can wait for another 45 minutes. <laughs> Oh, I'm just like, oh, okay. Don't panic. Have you got a glass of wine you can take from? <laughs> too early. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, we yeah. actually, yeah, we have vitamin water. Yes, yes, yes. This is it. <laughs> okay, so let's hope this is not going to happen again. And okay. so you were saying, obviously, coming from Finland, as you said, like Norway, it's, it's, it's kind of a special thing. You know, it's such a small community and, and it's special to be there. And obviously to go back, you know, to go and start your professional career, you had a lot of responsibility, I guess, as well for your country, as much as you wanted to be the start for this dancing. Well, I think uh, what uh, I think it comes, you know, yourself when you come from the small country, you've got maybe something more to prove. And we went out and we just thought, we don't care if somebody says we're not, we're not from one of the major politically influential dancing, traditionally influential countries, we thought we can prove everybody wrong and we just believed in what we were doing. And I think like everyone has said before us that we cho we chose, we were able to come across with the most fantastic teachers who believed in us in the same way that we did and nurtured our belief. And that way we didn't look back or we didn't look any other way we were always just going towards being a better dancer and we never I don't think we went in thinking we have to win this it no. became apparent at some point it could be the possibility and that's when we sort of took 
on the possibility a little bit more, but it was never the intention. And I think the attitude of competing became more like a sportsman's attitude that, okay, if we, we see there is an opportunity for us, so then we made a plan, like if we work on this and this is how soon we can actually achieve something. So it wasn't sort of like we have to win, but it was, of course, we were, when we realized that we are able to um, go higher on a level and we got some results proving that for us. So then it was more like we have a chance and then we would put everything on that one foot like we would work on things and we would find we would want to be creative in what we pre uh, produce and what would make us to go further so we did make a plan like a mm. sportsman like okay in in one year we can do this in five years this and in ten years this so it was sort of uh, but it was part of the game the dancing was still more important but I mean we both are very much like we enjoyed the challenge of the competing so it wasn't only about dancing but of course the bonus was really that our form of dancing is just the best there is nothing with i mean i mean ballroom and latin because there's nothing what which replaces the fact that two people can create something together i mean i did try other dance forms when i stopped as an amateur and before there was even a, yeah. uh, even a dream that we could dance as a pro so i tried every dance form like oh, okay it's better i dance solo because i want to do this and that and Nothing feels as good, good as Latin or ballroom, I think, you know, it's just, we have such an amazing form. Yes, and also I, I hope you heard probably a few comments of Anthony and and um, and Lorna and Michael and uh, Vicky and, and Michael, where they said that uh, 80s and 90s kind of were golden years. And uh, so why do you think, like, oh, you mentioned actually competition and sportsmen, like you were planning, like, a, a proper sort of competitive couple, but I, you always still had that beautiful dance about you. So you were not competitors as like, you know, sports people. So how do you manage to balance that out to still go there out to be competitive, but don't lose, not losing that dance part of it? Well, for us, um, I think one of the answers to that question would be that we were inquisitive and always looking for another new, um, inspiration outside of the technical ability and, and the actual pure uh, Latin American technique by uh, studying a lot of Cuban dances, Argentine tango, always music, music, music. We were both, we had a musical study behind us and then we, we also looked at a lot of theatre. Obviously living in London gives you a great chance of seeing the world-class theatre the whole time. It doesn't matter really what you see, what type of form of art you follow. If you go to a concert, if you go to an art gallery or you obviously see a performance where people dance and sing, it will inspire you one way or the other. Or sometimes you might even see, well, that's not something I want to do or let's avoid that. I think they didn't, you know, not being overly criticizing, but at the same time being being open minded to see what might work for you, not just take like go and see Phantom of the Opera and do a show about that. No, it's more like letting it filter in and then perhaps one day it will come Come to you so i think we were not if not gambling but also allowing influences in all the time and i i think that because the sportsmanship thinking in dance da competitive dancing dance sport whichever way you want to talk about it uh, started being more available or was more talked about when we competed so uh, I think we we must admit we we wouldn't be good only as a sportsman. I mm. I couldn't I couldn't do what the skiers do or something. So I think for us that this form of sport or competitive dancing was perfect because you train yourself like a, a sportsman, but then on the other hand there is this all this artistry, all the music, all the visual effects, all the interaction of two people or people with audience uh, performance side of it so it was basically a perfect uh, form for us and i don't think we would have done good as a pure sportsman no. so for us really the dancing was always the number one but then if you want to compete you need to realize like what makes you better as a person who can excel on the day not having the bad days you know that's mm. <laughs> eliminating the bad days by doing things what make you stronger mm. yeah we had a sports doctor we had a sports psychologist in our 
our team. We had obviously the osteopaths and the and the massage uh, train um, uh, people uh, behind us all the time. But then I think what saved us in the later part of the career was the the fact that we had already started to filter in some of the artistic inputs from our theatrical projects and and projects with uh, some other collaborators from other countries like Cuba and Argentina. So how much do you think if you think how much did all those other forms of dance influence your dancing? Mm, I think that's always hard to I mean obviously have tried to think about it as well and it's not the first time that has been asked but I think it is uh, difficult to measure because in a way even today when I listen to Mick and Lorna yet from yesterday and I'm thinking like oh my goodness I I realize now how many things have been like in a plot because we met them very early in our before we danced mm -hmm. together so there's so many things like an Espen I mean we had so many beautiful years with him Wally Lauren everybody so there's been so many things that uh, it's not only from other dance forms it's from the great people yeah. and uh, seeing some glimpses you can have in little videos in your head where you see somebody produce something and that can be your aim or dream to mm. produce like what can you influence I, I mean I can't miss her really no and it's a great network of those people that Silva mentioned also together with Alan and Hazel and uh, June, June McMurdo who obviously gave us a lot of technical knowledge and made it all beautifully danceable you know so it wasn't like it was never like the technique is a different issue it's a, a technique is what makes the dancing and without without that you haven't got a form and then on top of that it's so much easier to drop out any other influences but that you know it's all of those parts and every other, every one of those great teachers that we had was such a, an important part of the, the whole sort of lattice of, mm. of what we became. So it can we can, cannot put a percentage on any of it. I mm. think it's all together 100% and more. <laughs> right. yeah. And obviously, I think you probably heard a little bit, Trent, as the, the earlier the decades, uh, people tend to have less teachers, probably because they were maybe less available and because this, the dancing was in its development years. And then, of course, as the time goes, we realize that couples have more and more teachers. So what, what would be, you say, your optimal thing? Because I think you were in this age where you were in, I believe, an optimal still uh, decade where <laughs> sort of you had a good amount seems to be not, not too much. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think why we've like the teachers we had, we all with all of them, we kind of ourselves made a little bit like a, 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 this person is mainly for this or mainly for like, obviously it creates or, or it comes through the relationship as well, what starts to work on with any person you have lessons with. But then again, of course, everybody, every teacher has the opportunity to surprise you why, why they are good for you. Yeah. And I, I think uh, in a way, maybe what I might sometimes be envious about nowadays couples that they have an opportunity because of traveling and videos and everything to get so much more influence through the people who they maybe even don't have a lesson, but they can go and see the lecture or something when it wasn't so much even when we were young, <laughs> wasn't yeah. available. But I, I think it's about the fact how you combine it. I We had obviously the people we had lessons with like, um, on a regular basis and then we had enough time in between the lessons to work it out and I think that's where it doesn't matter you can have thousand and five hundred people teaching you <laughs> but if you don't have a time when you work it through to your dancing <laughs> it's not use it and I mean honestly I can tell you from our characters that if we would have gone for lessons for people we didn't want to listen it wouldn't have worked so we we knew ourselves that we only go for people who give us something and that's why it was really amazing because we then went and we felt we had this package we can work on and and then we when we would go back we wanted to respect our teachers and they would actually see we've been working on and mm. I think this is maybe nowadays a little bit funny because of course we all know that, that there is this opportunity that uh, you can go for many teachers because people are maybe more packed in like a London you can have on the same day you can even go for many teachers but I think all the teachers are quite clever to see if you come for real reasons or if you come for a visit and I think it is really then depending what you get back as well so I think also how the student is the teacher is so 
I think I, I hope all our teachers <laughs> feel that we tried at least tried to do what they <laughs> teach us because we really respect it, all of them. Yeah, sorry for if I've been a little bit difficult at some point in <laughs> you are listening, you all know what I mean. You could, you could see immediately <laughs> if he wouldn't want to listen, he would go. <laughs> okay. stubborn like anything but yes fantastic respect to all those people and they become more like a working working buddies almost like you, you create this sort of relationship with them so deep that it's not just a lesson it's actually an ongoing conversation a dialogue about what's going on not just about you it's about what dancing where should we take this dancing next and what, mm. what should be the next level as you as a champion you are responsible for form, forming the, uh, the form mm. giving it mm. the next uh, direction and i think also it's important to value the little moments it's like in life you meet somebody once in your life somewhere and you know that meeting was meaningful and for example okay Lorraine was for example somebody we couldn't meet so often but every time we met there was something we learned from her and one we want to mention I think we both yeah. want to mention is Bob Madeiros we only met him once for one and a half hours meaning double lesson never had a chance again because unfortunately he passed away before we made it to america uh, but uh, that meeting has always left an influence in our lives as a teachers as a dancers mm -hmm. and and also like a competitor so and also maybe a good example about that that how our teachers michael stilianos brought him into england mm -hmm. and he said you should have a lesson with this bob and i said well, we don't know because it doesn't matter you and we don't not, want to because know? we have yeah. we have your lessons or yeah. something you know so he said go go and have a lesson it'll be great for you and he was right so you, mm -hmm. we trusted our teacher and we took the lesson with an open mind and and it was it was still we just talked about it yesterday actually mm. funny enough you know yeah and then if you if touching um i, I think uh, again all the uh, other decades the guests from decades mentioned a lot of concentration on those times uh, on the mechanics on the on, on spontaneous dancing i think i was so surprised when they said they didn't even have sometimes routine they just go into competition without routine and dancing it and i was like really so i mean how do you feel about that Actually, that was all our one of the main because I said about the aims, what we set ourselves goals. One of the goals was that when we are on the top of our career, we can dance the whole comp without any any fixed choreography. But of course, you know, by that time we had been competing over 10 years. So it wasn't like we didn't have patterns, like what Lorna was saying, that you would have maybe sequences or something. Mm -hmm. But we did, he did a lot because he, of course, with the experience and with the confidence as well, because we became champions, he would do in the comp, he would change the order. He wanted to move on the floor to another place, or he wanted to make these people People clap to us so he would take a step which would he would repeat and repeat and repeat or something but of course it, it was not like we improvised only in the competition no. it was something what we pushed ourselves already to do in the practice and that's what we also kind of believe in our teaching that you need to make people to be able to start from a different part of the choreography or maybe direct it differently so I think these are some of the aims we have as a teachers as well not only mm. as when we were competing but I think we always envy the fact that uh, you could compete with the just the lead choreography and just lead yeah, and follow yeah lead and follow is yeah. one of our big aspects but I think that some of the most memorable fun and exciting moments in the competition uh, career were the ones where something went wrong and we managed to make it right and I think those stay more than the perfect sort of success of what you were set out to do I think I, I remember a few that were like that and they stay out as a memory and when you have more tense competitions or like when you have more pressure uh, obviously sometimes you feel that the body is not maybe available connection is not so available so then of course you play more safe you mm. you don't have the same freedom to trust each other or something or trust yourself actually i think it starts there that you need to trust yourself that you are able to answer any any request there is available like as a lady for example so do you think because of this obviously flexibility or trust or, or spontaneity, that's why perhaps even the floor craft was so much better because sometimes you can hear argument, you know, you come over couples come out of the floor and say, oh my God, you did wrong step. One step you've changed it and they panic. <laughs> 
Well, I, I think in our, um, well, this sounds like I'm becoming one of the old and ones, not, you know, not, in our uh, time, you know, when uh, we used to do. No, oh, but, you know, <laughs> no, but uh, what I mean is that I don't think we much had a problem about floor craft in our time because I think it's, uh, I'm not sure, I don't, I'm, I don't think it was a, a set rule, but it seemed like in the final you would have six spots on the floor and the floor was occupied. So nobody wanted to get on each other's spaces. And maybe there was sometimes in the earlier rounds, maybe somebody comes and sort of chases you, but that's part of the game and makes it also fun for the, for the audience. But then how you get out of the situation is I think where you take the real skill to dance yourself out of trouble. And I think yeah, that's and, something you need to be able to do. And I, I think many people are like, uh, especially young people who haven't had the chance to be at assembly practicing or something. I think the, the rules were set there. You don't touch anybody. Mm. You you don't hurt. You don't. You can. You need to dare to dance very close, but you don't touch don't, anybody. Yeah, don't so invade. I yeah. think it was part, and I I like that excitement. I I knew that okay. I have that much that much space, and uh, then of course you know they find the way to tell if he if I knew he couldn't see or something, or I I was getting a bit too excited my <laughs> movement. So sort of that you need to measure that you actually have the space for the floor yeah, craft. Floor craft is one of the mm. major it's issues one on, of the, on the floor, yeah. and, and it's I, supposed to be touched by the way, yeah. not the looks like what do you do on yeah, my way. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I think she mentioned Simli, which some, some of the viewers may still remember. And it was the, the very, very famous uh, ballroom in London, <clears throat> Norbury, where we would gather, all of us really, to practice every, well, not every not night, every but night. you know, but several nights of the week. And sometimes it would be the full final on the floor in heat number one. And that was where you really learned how to handle the situations. The floor wasn't big, it was packed. And it was always an excited audience there. So it became almost like a final or a, a competition or a show every night when you went in there. Yes, for sure. Mm. And um, would you say like, uh, I mean, every, dan every dancer sort of has a little stamp on there, you know, like uh, Michael, I think is famous for Pasadoglia, as I mentioned yesterday. And, and uh, I think somehow you are rumba dancers. Would you not agree? Like you always had this magical rumba about you. <laughs> What do you think, Sirpa? I, I suppose that's what we've been <laughs> titled for, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, not that uh, I, I did love Roomba. I, mean, mm. I don't know what you want to well, say. You, well, we used to do quite well in the Roomba as well as in the Paso Doble. So, Michael, thank you very much. Michael mentioned <laughs> my name as one of the, the good and famous Paso Doble dancers. So that maybe those two were like yeah, yeah. Our trademark dances and uh, we let the light-hearted dances to some, some, other, <laughs> some other fantastic couples to be, be. But were they actually your favorite dances and you practiced the most? How that becomes part of yours? Is this just something in your feeling, in your charisma, that that's how you feel about? Mm, I think I think also it depends what you work on. And mm -hmm. I think in Rumba and Paso, maybe earlier we found the storylines really connecting. And also for the shows, we felt that they were easier to produce. But I, I do love Cha Cha and Samba, but just sometimes in the comps, you might feel maybe easier, like uh, you didn't get the same fluidity or something. But uh, I, I mean, I, I love all the five and I love the ballroom as well, but maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that's my problem i love to, them too much <laughs> well we used to both dance ballroom as well you know so we were but 10 yeah, dancers no, not ballroom, that, yeah. but... <laughs> oh you don't call it ballroom <laughs> and if you if you were again because uh, i'm asking this question everyone that's what the the last question uh, as espen was answering so we're creating that decade a perfect couple a perfect couple and you're allowed to take three things from your decade and you're allowed to mix three things from today's decade. So create that perfect couple. Should we do that together then? No. No? No. <laughs> I do my Oh, really? Yes, really? Yes. Well, I, I like from our time and earlier to take the, the fact of uh, precision of foot, foot pressure, feet and leg actions. And that leads to the correct body actioning of each five characteristic dances so really i think that sums up the character of characterization of all dances musicality dancing with music staying true to the rhythm 
and each five different rhythms. And then um, also very important from which is not so prevalent at the moment is usage of all different basic forms of holds, holds of different types and using that. And I never like to see choreography where you dance something in the hold, then you let go and dance separately you kind of stop and take up a hold and dance. It, it needs to be intertwined so that it dances in and out of holds using them. I don't think it's a hold if you just touch and do nothing with it. You, you, you take a hold and use it to create something between the two. So those three issues from, in my opinion, from the earlier era, anything to add or would you agree? Ah, oh, okay. So in this <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, obviously, the whole I, I, on my, on my <laughs> I miss the structuring of the because there, there can be a lot of couples in a big com events where there is no knowledge of holes. And of course, this mm. is not only down to the couples, it's down to the teachers as well. And I am calling for respect to our form of dancing. But I think that uh, if combining the holes to nowadays, good things about nowadays, that there's more flexibility in people's mind, what is accepted, because I, I know from own experience that we did try some things and we know that uh, some of even our teachers but also many um, people watching found them a bit unorthodox and I think that's a good thing about nowadays that nowadays that it's not uh, so easily seen as an unorthodox thing but it's actually there's so much more fluidity in the from the holes to holes so I love that as mm. a combination mm. five dances definitely has to be there and I think with the foot action, hip action, body shaping. This is where maybe nowadays is a bit of a lack of knowledge in the character. There tends to be a general type of movement and maybe even using the same steps, not for maybe so much, but in Latin, same steps, because it, this looks good on you, we'll use it now in every dance. There. So that I don't, and especially with the kids, I don't accept that, that just for the result, you use the same steps in every dance because they look good on this. So, and I think that's again down to judges to notice that difference. Mm. Um, and then good things from the past, obviously dancing together with the partner. I think it's the whole soul of our form of dancing mm. and um, music, yes. Um, then good things about nowadays. Well, I think it's fabulous how the, the knowledge is available. No, uh, knowledge, maybe not so much the knowledge, it's always been available if you wanted to look for it. But the fact that influences are so easily found, and if you're a clever dancer, you can take influence in a second from yeah. on the internet if it works, you know, and then um, that's one thing that I think people could use to their advantage these days. And um, you carry on. Uh, maybe like athletic awareness and focus. I mean, people are much more aware maybe that they have to they have to work on their physics by themselves and and i think also in our form of dancing it's good that people see the visual effect of it as well so obviously it's not and the fitness level i mean yeah, you, fitness was you also, couldn't you mm. can't enter now comp and being forgiven that maybe your neck is aching or something so basically you have enough knowledge and and also the will to t look after these things and yeah, I think the athletic awareness and focus maybe is a good kind of uh, mm. way of saying it. And then the styling, dresses, hair, makeup, uh, people are allowed to think about that much more, you know, and uh, it's kind of encouraged. And I think that's beautiful because it makes the whole whole visual image much better. And that, that's not saying it wasn't thought about before, but it's just this amazing availability these days. Yeah. You have all these amazing fabrics and colors and textures and everything so available mm. and many more stone colors. We used to have AD only. <laughs> 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 he wants to go back with his uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, it sounds like a couple, a couple. I mean, I I hope that the youngsters listening and making notes and, and, and yeah, and in in dancing, of course, we have um, phenomenal bodies on the floor sometimes now with, with the great flexibility, and so that's that's really mm. eye catching. Yes, it's it's lovely. I mean, that, that just sounds perfect, couple. So I hope <laughs> when we come back from the lockdown, I can we can see those couples. <laughs> Hopefully, everybody's been using the time very well to their yes. advantage now that they've had time and, to reflect. Uh, 
every action. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So Marcus and Karen already waiting. So shall we let them in? Or yes, if they, if we let them in, is there anything you maybe made notes and you wanted to to say something? Well, actually, I kind of said it already, but I, I just wish to send all the all the dancers yeah. of the world the best of our um, wishes for um, maintaining their spirits and their positivity. I'm sure we're going to come out of this soon and then you will be all able to come out and show how fabulous you've become. Well, yes. we haven't been watching. Yeah, high spirits to everybody and stay healthy, safe. And thank you, Sneakul, so much for hosting us. Thank you. Yes, for so just that. stay for a second. We can say hello to Marcus and Karen. They are the Marcus and Karen. Would you look cozy in your fiber? <laughs> We've been here all night waiting. It's not just <laughs> us talking. <laughs> Sorry, we had a it's little. Great. We had a little um, technical glitch. Wi-Fi just gone a little bit dead between switching from Espen to Euchre, and so we had to delay a little bit. So I'm really sorry about that. It's always the same with the Latin dancers, Negrali. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, they're just too electric. <laughs> <laughs> we just can hold it longer, you know. <laughs> Are you in Finland or in London now? Yeah, yeah we're in Finland. Finland. Yes. Is it cold there? It's a bit cold uh, today. Today yeah. minus yeah. minus eight here. Yeah. Wow, no ski doing then. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's I mean, we lovely. actually just last week we went a little bit skiing, but uh, yeah, it's it's a cold now. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. But it's sunny today. Sunny, yeah, it's beautiful. So rainy right here, of course. We are actually <laughs> a little bit stuck here because there is no flights to London. So no, we, I know. we were supposed to visit uh, or yeah. come to London in January, but we ha we are still here. <laughs> You've had your time Take now, care. so bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Luca and Sirva, and uh, God bless you, and hope to see you soon. Yes. Hope to see you bye, soon. Bye. Bye. bye, bye. bye. <laughs> well done, Stigwali. You kept nice and calm, didn't you, through all that little interlude? <laughs> I, I had a little panic attack, but yes, <laughs> hopefully oh, that's not going to happen now. So how are you both? And thank you so very much for joining me. <laughs> well done, Snagwali. It's a marvellous thing you're doing. Great idea. Just, yeah, we're OK, aren't we? We haven't, we haven't killed each other yet, though, have we? We tried a few times, but <laughs> <laughs> unsuccessfully. <laughs> I'm digging a big hole in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah. right. No, having a great time, actually. It's good. Good, good. So let's obviously you a little bit know what it's all about. And you know, it's about uh, decades and walking through and uh, moving through the decades. And obviously you had um, a most amazing uh, changes through the decades. One decade you was a uh, very successful Latin dancers and, you know, champions in Latin. And, and then suddenly the next decade you were uh, champions for 10 years or more, 11 years or, and in, in ballroom. So just let's a little bit go of what happened there. How did you just suddenly woke up one morning and decided that? What well, I think I improved at ballroom. No, I, actually, <laughs> if you think back to the time, I mean, as a junior, I was a junior British Latin champion, 1976. Karen was fourth with her partner. So obviously I was the Latin influence and, uh, and that carried on. We got together and uh, we obviously, like everybody did, does still now maybe, we did 10 dances. So we, we always practiced 10 dances. And uh, as you said, we were really successful in Latin, winning worlds and British and Europeans, which is amazing. Uh, and then we, I think when we turned pro, we won the, the world 10 dance. And then I think we started to realize, um, we started looking at the technique, being professional, we took our exams. And I think uh, Latin changed from sort of the elegant style and, and mm. effect to more raunchy. Uh, more earthy. More earthy Latin. I, th I don't think we left Latin. I think Latin, Latin left, left us. us, to be honest. <laughs> I've got a you. funny story, actually. We were doing uh, a 10 dance show in Japan, in Hiroshima, for Tommy and Cherry Sakamoto. I'll never forget this. And this samba routine that Alan Hazel Fletcher gave us. And I had to do a ripple, spin away from Karen, did a ripple, and I opened my arms, and nothing happened. And I said to Karen, I think we've got to stop doing Latin shows. And Latin... Time to go. That was it, wasn't it? But I think the improvement at Snigwali, what happened was that we were just a bit unorthodox or Marcus was in ballroom. It was very, very natural. And um, But when we started demonstrating, because we were Latin in 10 dance, we did so many 10 dance shows. And suddenly you've got to start with a piece of music and you've got to finish with it. And you've got to kind of finish in the middle of the room so it all looks pretty and a few lifts here and there and make it packaged very nicely. Whereas 
Marcus used to do such a lot of freestyle dancing, but that discipline of having to start and finish with the music and phrase it, like goodness, phrasing, um, I think it, it the discipline improved and gave us freedom to do what we could do in ballroom. Right. Bearing in mind, I came from a ballroom stable. So my, you know, my original teachers, George Code and Pat Thompson, the same as Andrew Sinkinson. So we were a real ballroom school. So it was the meeting of the two worlds, really. Boring ballroom, is that what it was? Never boring ballroom, never. <laughs> And, and I'm sure you heard uh, uh, Anthony uh, saying that 80s and 90s, in his opinion, were golden years in dancing. And obviously, you're definitely in that decade, so you must feel <laughs> accelerated about that. Anthony was great. Uh, we listened to him the other day. And, you know, I see Anthony, or used to see Anthony, one, at least once a year in, in China, Shenzhen. And uh, we've often spoken about the, those years. I mean, as far as we're concerned, they were great times, hard times, because you know, we're competing and wanting to win. And the, the, the fabulous feeling that you had when you won uh, didn't compare with the horrible feeling that you had when you lost. Um, so th thankfully, you know, th those people at the time, we all won and we all lost. Uh, but the era of, of um, the, you know, the people we look up to, the, uh, our time of, of obviously Bill and Bobby, we didn't see live doing a comp, but we saw them doing shows. Peter and Brenda, obviously, um, Robin and Rita, Michael and Vicky, uh, Richard and Janet, those people were, were inspirational and, and you don't forget those days, but we had a special era, didn't we, the, the 80s and 90s? It was yeah, a, I a think special so. era. I think the times against John and Anne brought the best out in both of us. Mm. And, and the whole world, it was an excitement for the whole world to see who would come out better, who performed better, who'd bring something new to the table. But they were hard so you know they quite damaging really <laughs> you either sunk or, or swim, swim about it you know so but we're all um, different we all have different characteristics and mm. we are different images and different styles and all ballroom of course but different types of ballroom yeah and obviously as i said you know you, you spanned your dancing span for a very long time from like early late 80s and then to late 90s and obviously styles were so different in late 80s to when you are finished it was kind of nearly well up to uh, nearly like today really and and obviously it must be quite difficult or pressurizing because you let you let the fashion you let the uh, styling you let all that so where did you get all that and how did that feel to do that well it was hard work Snigwali. So <laughs> nothing happened by accident and as a champion you have a massive responsibility to the development of future dance but even fashion you know oh my goodness i would read books i can remember going to australia and picking up i bought this chiffon scarf because it was pale peach shaded into blue and we never had shaded fabrics then but i was going to have that shaded fabric brought it back to gorgeous Elaine Gornell and uh, she actually painted it to find those colors but nothing was by accident everything was preparation uh, research music and it was hard work but it was wonderful work so mm. it was a joy to find something we were laughing about trying to find music every time we were in Japan and we used to be sometimes three months of the year in Japan we used to go to this dusty old record shop and buy hundreds of Astor Piazzolla Tango. CDs mm. and listen through them and listen through them and you know 60 of them would have nothing that we could use and when we suddenly heard something that could be used you know it was difficult splicing music together we spent hours with Len Collier trying to make music into a, a strict tempo for us to dance with um, but you were so excited to find that piece of music whereas nowadays you can just go and Spotify or Shazam it's not quite as thrilling finding you know those something words. special. I do know those words. <laughs> I don't know how to use them, but I know Shazam. what they are. <laughs> you yeah. know, so all those things just made it more exciting. We did, um, we were doing a demonstration at Sheffield University, one of the huge intervarsity. And on the way, on the radio, we heard this piece of music and it was Billy, Billy Eckstein, Eckstein and Sarah, Sarah Vaughan, Vaughan, this was. Passing Strangers. And we just loved it. So <laughs> on the way, we went into Sheffield Shopping Centre and we bought this little, it would be a record then. CD, CD, CD. CD. And we just danced to it and we'd never danced before. And I, even now I can feel the magic and the thrill of doing that. Yeah. So wonderful times.
And so obviously when you said uh, research and so much uh, work went behind the scenes, as you say, so if you would, were giving maybe a little comparison to today's dancers, is it because is it easier for them to access and that's why they perhaps not researching enough because it's so easy? Or do you think they do that same and or what advice would you give to today's to to, to develop like this? Because your development from that age to that age in 10 years, it was phenomenal. It's a learning curve, Snigwali, isn't it? You know, you, you start off with nothing and you end up with nothing, of course, but you, you, build, you build everything. It's like building a house from the foundations, you know, through technique and then through to putting the, the dressing on top of it. But I think, yeah, today's people, we know with Henry, our own son, that he can get things like that, you know, instant. and instant. It, it's that instant thing that is dangerous, isn't it? But then they've, they've developed as well. And today's dancers have developed in different ways, some good, some bad. Um, but it is instance, isn't it? It really, and I think this, you know, what's possibly going to be two years of, of uh, no dancing, physical dancing that we know it anyway, especially in this country, um, it, it, you, you learn so much. And even Henry, who can't be at uni because it's closed, he's learning more things at home and being around us rather than being in his uh, digs at uni, you know? So I think, I think also it's attention to detail. Hmm. You know, even with the, the you know, you could say we're talking about the dress fabrics, how exciting. When we first started to dance, we had no stretch fabric. So the, the ballroom dresses were made on a boning system. So you didn't have any leotard underneath, it wasn't happening. So that boning system was plastic and it used to break through your fabric into your arms, under your arms. So all those girls from our era, so they, we all had terrific side postures to the sides <laughs> because if you, if you collapse slightly, this plastic would literally draw blood. So the, you know, there's the, the, all the development and everything like that is amazing. I used to go every single night to my dressmaker. She'd do a little bit more, a little bit more, and we would build the character of every dress for the occasion, whether it be the international, whether it was a show dress or something. Whereas now, I mean, I do know some, some gorgeous dancers, but they have boxes of dresses sent through and like, what are you wearing? Well, when the box of dresses arrives, I'll choose. It's like the, no idea what's going on. So there. all that time that you were dancing, you were in pain. And I thought it was me. I always had pins in, in the wrong places. <laughs> it's but it's attention to detail, you know. We even used to, what we used to wear to go to a competition was important because it put you in the right frame of mind. You wanted to look like the champion at all times. So that was our mindset. And It's the first impression, isn't it? You know, yeah. these days you see people come into competitions dressed in tracksuits, whatever they come in. And that's a lasting impression. I remember... I think it was Stephen Hillier wrote something in Dance News about um, Len Collier, I mentioned him twice, Len Collier. He used to have students going to practice at Blackpool and used to walk down the Blackpool Winter Gardens Empress Ballroom stairs. And they used to be dressed in three-piece suits, the men, and ladies in cocktail dresses for the practice. And if they didn't, if they missed a tie or something, he'd send them back home to get, to get to dressed properly. You know, it's that first impression. It's the first impression. Well, we have it? to move on as well, yeah, but, we you know. And then also, well, but you know, without um, movement and, and, and as you said, the decade, was you not scared a little bit, like with all your inventions that, you know, the homework you will do, you'll come out with this beautiful, some kind of invention of your dress or a music, something, and that people will criticize. Have you ever been scared <laughs> of that? I think, I think the prime example of that, at one point we were quite famed for our quick step and particularly in the team match at Blackpool. So I can remember we used to set off down that floor <laughs> like bats out of hell, hit the splits, get back up again and, not me, not and me. enjoy it and laugh our socks off. So we thought, right, we've done that for like three years. This next team match, we're going to do it properly. So we started off and we did basic quick step all around the floor. And it had a very numbing effect. <laughs> and lovely Corky Ballas, he said, man, he said, are you, are you sick? <laughs> are you sick? What's happening? Please get better for next Friday. I'm trying <laughs> to be correct. Yeah, yeah, that didn't work. So, you know, you have to try things though, don't you? The great teacher, <laughs> one, of our, one of our main coaches, Benny Tolmeyer, we had to do um, a basic competition in Germany, Super World Cup or something, mm. wasn't it? And we had five basic dances, including the Venus Waltz, and then a show. And uh, we went to wet Benny for some lessons. He said to me, why, when you dance basic, do you look stiff and you have a stiff neck? He said, when you're doing all your choreography, you just relax and you just move through. He says, don't try and dance basic like basic. 
dancing like it's choreography, which it is, of course. Yeah. That yeah. was. I think he said your lights have gone out. Your lights have gone yeah. out. Yeah, that's true. So you mm. have to use the technique to entertain, not but, educate. But we never, we didn't think about that we were sort of the icons or making fashion. We just did what we thought we had to do. You know, from an early age, we wanted to win and compete and make people happy, really. If the audience, I'm sure Mr. Short's listening to this, he used to say to me sometimes, uh, you, the audience didn't go with you, so you didn't dance very well. And I suppose it's very hard because as a human being and the people we are, we need that, we need that sort of rapport with the audience. So in the end of the day, uh, I realized it wasn't about pleasing the judges, it was about pleasing the audience, really. And if they went with you, if they didn't go with you, tough luck, make it act, you know. Um, but that was a, a very famous thing in my mind. Good. And touching a little bit, because you just touched it on, on your quick step. I mean, you were always famous for your quick step. You, you had the most bubbly, happy, uh, light and flowy quick step. And you would, you would never be tired. I've never seen you ever get tired ever after all these rounds. And, and yet you, 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 you were obviously sporty, but you, you, you still danced it. And so what would be advance, uh, advance, ad advice sorry, for today's dancers not to become too just sporty and running around, but still having that liveliness? I think, uh, Snigoli, we talk about preparation. So before a competition, you have to be fit enough to do what you're capable of doing. But our fitness regime, and I know the body physiques have to be gym trained and honed, but you know, our fitness regime was to dance. And we used to, our major one was to do a series of four and a half minute Viennese waltzes. Oh, wow. So, and, and when we first started to do it, I felt that my teeth were gonna oh, yeah. drop out. <laughs> So because not that you had false teeth. Not you had false teeth. <laughs> because you know, if you're if you're running and, and, and walking, you know, you don't have to look beautiful. You can sweat, you can, you know, everything can be tight. You, you're you're pumping, you're working it. But you have to train to to be beautiful still, to keep the posture, the poise, um, the softness in the back and the arms, and still keep going. But that was our regime. And also at Starlight, before Blackpool, you know, we have four flights of stairs at Starlight and they're just killers. Ask anybody. So I knew I was ready for Blackpool if I could run up the stairs, run back down and run up the stairs again and walk in without collapsing. <laughs> and that, was a, that was just a little thing we used to push ourselves it's all the time. It's not the same now. I mean, I now can, we stagger up the oh, stairs. <laughs> I keep thinking of Bill Irving at the end, you know, he, was, he would make up those stairs and he'd touch his head to his knee. Amazing. But I think, you know, we, we did feel tired in competitions, but there's something called a pain barrier, yes. which you break through. And we broke through that. I mean, I was a runner before I danced and a football. So you have to go through pain barriers. But I think for the future of um, dancers of today and the future, I think you make everything look easy. That's the main thing. I always tell the, the students, you know, make every if you can make it look brilliant and still look easy, especially in quick step, you've got you've got the, the gift because it's not about who can move the most around the floor. I think Anthony said that, or who's the fastest on the floor, who can jump the highest, who can swing the deepest. It's actually about a whole character of quick step, which has all those, it's like a good meal with all the different ingredients, isn't it? If you're missing pepper, something missing. Missing, what did you put in my soup of the day? Turmeric or something, it was, ooh. <laughs> Anyway. Karen's becoming a great cook. Well, she always was a great cook, but some of the stuff she's doing these days. Oh. Too much time. Anyway. Too much time. Right, and, and also uh, touching a little bit of the character, just touching quick step character, but I, I, really, I, I really feel that all the dancers were very, very characteristic. And most important, big difference for today, I felt that every dance had its own personal choreography. So there wasn't like walls doing walls figures in Foxtrot or in Tango. Mm -hmm. And so do you think that was also a big influence for the, you know, keeping the character of the dance? Yeah, I mean, I'm, we're very open-minded with choreography, aren't we? Um, but I, I, think... I can remember when we did double reverse spin, over spin, double reverse spin in tango for Anthony. And he was not happy. He was not happy about that, was he? He was not happy. It's not a tango and, you know, we're saying, it's too, we keep going up on this. Because <laughs> you're supposed to. <laughs> it was like, teach us how to keep and it And then down, we did that, we, we got it this way. But yeah. And, you ooh. have to explore. But I mean, there's nothing new. I remember so, the first competition we went to, a big competition after we retired, 1999, was international. Horrible watching the comp. Actually, it wasn't horrible. It was great not to be in the comp. We'd done enough, you know. We'd uh, reached our peak and reached our level. But um, I looked down at a tango, one particular couple in tango, 
they must have gone around the floor about 16 times. And I looked at Karen and we both thought the same thing. Chassis run, chassis run. There was no tango characterization at all. Thankfully, that didn't really catch on. Yeah, but I mean, work. that was a heck of a shock to me to see that. I remember that. <laughs> that was 1999, you know. And then uh, uh, I remember being in Italy. It was uh, an IDSF competition, I think, at the time. And I'm judging. And they all did the honor dance uh, presentation waltz. And every single one of them ran. Like a run here and a run there and a pass the feet. Not one couple close the feet. And I'm thinking... What's happening here? And thankfully, again, that didn't really continue that long. You know, characters of the dance are very important. Characters of yourself as well. Like I said earlier at the beginning of the, the interview, I think, you know, each couple should find their own identity in life. And I, I and think on the floor. you can't lie to yourself as a dancer. You are as you are. So your soul has to come through your dancing to make it make it you. There was a lovely comment. One of the original um, superstars, it wasn't called superstars then, but it was in Australia. And the, the top three ballroom couples were the, was ourselves. There was Andrew Sinkinson dancing with Adele and Augusto Katrina. and Katerina. And afterwards we went in the bar and there was a lovely guy, uh, Doug Potter was there. And yeah. he gave Great this dancer. analysis of the three of us. And he said, that's Schiavo. He said, his legs and feet, he's like a tractor. He said, huge wheels, square wheels. So he said it could be a bit more refined, but man, he eats up the floor. So we, we all, yeah, 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 yeah. And then he said, oh, and that Andrew Sinkinson and Adele, he said, beautiful wheels, smooth. absolutely smooth wheels, but they're too small. Tiny and he wheel. said, so they're tiny and smooth, but a little bit small. Wait for it, it's coming. And then he said, and that Hilton, he's got it just about right. <laughs> so he said, he's got a bit of both. Friend for life. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it's the way he summed it up and you can yeah. see that in the couples individual but nobody changed you know Gusto didn't try to be us or Andrew or the other way around we all stuck to who we were who we were believing in so and I have a little question from you just touched as well about movement and, and the wheels now I also remember seeing you live many times in competitions and on, on screen on tv and your movement was always really really beautiful and quite big frankly and, and yet, uh, you said you never really uh, mentioned earlier, you don't think about movement. So how did you, how did that happen? Why the couples this, uh, these days, they're afraid that they're not going to move unless they push themselves to move. So how did that happen? How do you coordinate that? Well, it was, I think, uh, I don't know, maybe in both our minds that everything we did had to look easy refined because obviously we went to one teacher um we, when we were latin champions we really didn't had no idea about the technique as i said earlier we just went out well, there speak for yourself. and try well just went out there and try <laughs> try to look good and, and win and make everybody happy you know including the judges and then as i say we turned pro and then started looking at the technique a lot more and, and getting more involved with it so we were aware of the technique but we didn't really think of the technique on the floor we just danced but one teacher in particular changed my, my, my mindset early on before we actually won anything in ballroom. And we started to learn about the mechanics of dance. And for about six months, that took me back. We, we went absolutely worse, you know. And then once we'd got that ingrained into us, muscular memorize, we used that with our natural ability to move. And I think we've always been lovely movers, haven't we? So we've always been good movers and easy. But I'll tell you a quick story about Bill, Bill and Bobby doing a show in the Empress Ballroom. And many years ago, um, Walter Laird and, and Lorraine, Wally and Lorraine, they were doing the Latin show. And of course, in that big Empress ballroom, no chairs, people standing around the floor, massive floor. And Wally stood in the middle of the floor and brought the house down. So Bill being Bill, he said they went on that floor and tried to move as much as they could from one end to the other. And it was the worst show, he said, we'd ever done. And they were throwing shoes at each other in the dressing room. And then not all the motorways were, were figured then. So it took them 12 hours to drive back to London, straight into the studio. I tell the pupils this. And then being smokers, Bill put his cigarette lighter on the floor and tried to dance a, a promenade, a chassis, as a, a natural turn, as long as he could, big as he could. Then he closed his eyes and just moved his body and he moved further. And I'll never forget that. If you look like you're trying too hard, you're not trying hard enough. And it's a mind of a matter to allow the body to flow. That's a beautiful advice, I think, for, for dancers, right? That's and I feel a little sorry for our dancers of today because with all the tools that they've got, all the instant information and the over analysis, they, you know, it, it just gets paralyzed and they, you know, they want to move another millimeter here or there instead of just letting 
body cover it. We didn't have all of that. We didn't have films as such to criticize every single step we did. And therefore we trusted in our teachers. And if someone said it looked better, then it looked better and we had to accept that. Um, and it just wasn't so instant. And we had to have a belief in people. Whereas nowadays the couples have so much information, so much choreography, um, it's hard to decide what to do. I'll give you another quick example, Snigwali, because we're doing quite a bit of online teaching and one couple in particular have a lesson every week, two lessons every week. And he studies everything totally. He's been studying his own videos, other people's videos. And he said to me, Marcus, uh, when you put your arms up, is your right and your left elbow at the same level? I said, of course, obviously difference in tango, but in the swing dance, of course. He said, no, it isn't. Yours wasn't, mine isn't, Arunas's wasn't. And he's saying that the lady's arm actually is at the same height as his elbow, lady's elbow. And I said, you're thinking too much. You don't, we don't, we don't see that. You know, you don't think, and he says, yeah, I think I need to drop my arm a bit. I mean, it's, it's paralysis of analysis really, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. hard work. Mm. Yeah, that's true. I have a little cheeky question sort of I want to ask. If you were to come back now to dance. Oh no. <laughs> would, you, would you change how you dance or would you do exactly the same? Um, I think we'd have to have a few lessons. <laughs> we'd have to have a few knee replacements, oh. probably. <laughs> um, I think we were quite happy with our last performances. I think the thing is, to Gwali, to you, know, we, you know, thankfully, you know, we were, and we really appreciate, obviously, this, this but we were so successful and we've, we felt that we wanted to get, we got to where we wanted to get to as far as our dancing and our feeling together was concerned wasn't it and I think you know luckily we've been together now for is it 150 years well, we've been together a long long time since 1978 and before that so we know each other so well we traveled around the world together all those years you know so I think well, if we came if we did come back now put ourselves in the 2020s uh no we'd just do the same I think you know, I'm so glad you said that because I think they were golden ages, those, those years. And I think those, especially the late 90s and early 2000s, I think mm. if those couples would wear to come back, I'm sure every, they would win. I doubt it. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't think but, so. But I think no. there, would be a, there would be a nice contrast, As that's we, for sure. Every uh, interview that you You wouldn't fit in the tail suits, <laughs> Oh, the I would skinny do. sausage arms. You no, 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 no. Those, Thanks, okay. Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> no, the funny thing is, well, and I totally agree with what Anthony said and what you said about the sausage as well. Um, but it didn't sound very good, did it? Anyway, uh, I, I looked at some of my old videos. Well, I didn't look at, saw it on YouTube. My tail suit today would look terrible. It was a has to be tail suit, uh, expensive uh, tail suit. Looked great at the time, but you put that tail suit on the floor now. All right, some of the tail suits are ridiculous at the moment, but I think towards the end now, the, the top pros, uh, they've got the, the suits about almost for today's dancing, correct. Yeah, they're, getting not, it, they're getting better, aren't they? I think they're getting yeah. better. Yeah. Yes, I think there was one stage, like a couple of years ago, they went really narrow, like yeah. really narrow, but I agree, as some of them quite nice already now, but yeah. I would have looked like a pair if that had happened with me, wouldn't I? Because I've got no shoulders. And I would have looked like that. Oh, no, I would never. No, thank you. And they, the boys used to walk on like this, didn't they? That some of the young juniors with their arms sticking out. So why are they doing that? They're trying to be he-men. No, they can't lower their arms. The suits are too tight. <laughs> Crazy. Oh, anyway. And if you were to, uh, so obviously you, you're clearly not coming back. Uh, so sorry, this is <laughs> you wouldn't fit in the tail suit. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, I remember that one. <laughs> but if you if you were to create a perfect couple, you, if you could just mold now perfect couple and could take three items from your time and three items from current day, what would those be? Shall I do our time? Can you do the other? All right, All right. go on. Then. I think our time number one would be individuality, mm -hmm. for sure, for sure, and musicality, and possibly a little bit more respect. I think we all had a bit more respect. Um, simple things like when we had the big duels with John and Anne, if they beat us, it wasn't because um, they were much better. It's We kind of thought we weren't good enough. So, so we had a respect, yeah, they were much better, but we had to get better to beat them. We didn't blame the judges. You, you had one day of that, but there was a, a respect as to how good they were. So we have to get better. And I'm not sure that's quite as 
it should be today and respect mm. for everything. So that's what something could be worked upon, I feel. Yeah, I, th I agree, and... totally agree. I think now, uh, since the times of John Delroy and uh, Richard Nan and, and phrasing and tech, that sort of uh, aspect of, of dancing, the dance of today, I think I'm more aware of that. And the more aware of, of um, especially the Viennese Waltz, more aware of that. So I think in our days, um, maybe we're not as aware at the beginning of our early success of, of those aspects. We became more aware of them. But I think today's dancers, uh, they, they are more athletic. Whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. The top pros and amateurs don't show that athleticism. I think they they hide it, which I like very much. And like everyone that you've interviewed so far, I said there is so, and you said, Snugali, there's so much talent out there, isn't there? There always was talent. There, all, there always will be talent. You know, it, but I think at the moment, um, hopefully when we all come out of this, there are so much great dancers out there, both WDSF, WDC, who, you know, hopefully we'll all get together and, and we'll be able to see just how much dancing has improved. And I think I would like to take that future of us all dancing together back into our lives. Oh, that, that I could definitely have, I meant for that, because that would be wonderful. Imagine all the dancers around the world meeting in, or let's say on Blackpool for or whatever floor and, and joining again how it used to be. That would be fabulous. And just before we finish, is there anything you would like to say to the dancers to wish something you would like from your heart? Well, I expect to see when we come back the most perfect heel turns from the girls because that's all you've been able to practice in your kitchen and heel pulls. And um, I just want to give everybody love and a big hug, a big hug. That's all yeah. we want to do, really. You know? And I think love for dance and, you know, we will come out of this better mm -hmm. and we'll have learned a lot from it. I mean, I only spoke to a neighbor yesterday and I said, have you ever had a, have you had a cold within the last 12 months? He said, no. I said, that's because we've been wearing the masks. We're not really shaking hands. We're not touching, are we? So, you know, well, hopefully... When we can, it's oh. going to be so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I think just... The atmosphere is going to be amazing. And I think, it's going to be it. so positive. Know it, that we'll all do what we can yeah. to make this world a better place, especially our fabulous ballroom industry. It'll be better. Well, I hope so. It's, it's beautiful. Thank you so very much and such a positive message. And I hope that the boys and girls are listening, taking notes. And I totally agree on those heel turns. So let's watch those <laughs> beautiful We'll be watching this is those Karen, spin turns. Karen heel, this is Karen heel turn and Marcus heel turn. <laughs> Congratulations, Snagwali, on what you've job. done, my darling. It's, it's yes. a real inspiration.